Hello, Steamboat Willie here. Once again, jumping on the YouTube bandwagon with a US versus UK video. Today, I'm going to be talking about trains. US versus UK. Now, most of the video, I'm going to be talking about the lower 48 states of, of the USA versus Great Britain. Because there are a few exceptions to the sort of general scheme of things, for instance, um, Northern Irish Railways are very different to the railways in Great Britain, so really there's going to be talking about mainland US uh, versus Great Britain, but I'll talk about those exceptions towards the end of the video. Now, the railways in America throughout the 19th century developed pretty much in the same way as the railways in Britain and elsewhere in the world. Um, so, railway companies started up and they would build a railway and then operate the trains. Yeah, you know, like a railroad tycoon. All well and good. It's only when we get to the second half of the 20th century where things start to change a little bit. In 1923, all those disparate small railway companies were grouped into four big railway companies, the LNER, the Great Western Railway, the Southern Railway and the LMS, the London, Midland and Scotland Railway. In 1948 the uh, Labour government then nationalised the railways bringing all the railways under British Railways under nationalised control. Um, from then, for, you know, up, up until the 90s, British Railways was all one big state-owned organisation. In the 1990s the Conservatives by then were in power and decided to put the railways back into privatised ownership but in a completely different organisation. So Railtrack was formed in 1994 it would own the tracks and the trains would be uh, franchised off so companies would um, bid to run a particular route or a particular set of routes um, and it was still pretty much managed by the government but run by a privatised firm and then the trains themselves were sold off to rolling stock companies who would lease the the trains to these companies. It was quite a messy um, organisation. Railtrack itself only lasted until 2002 um, when having lost a large amount of money um, I think it was after the Hatfield crash um, it was brought back under government ownership as Network Rail. So the actual tracks themselves are now back under government ownership. Freight is a completely different thing um, altogether. The freight sectors um, have been sold off to uh, initially English, Russian, Scottish Railway and Freightliner um, and also Direct Mail Services which is the only freight company that's still owned by the government. It's actually owned by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority um, because it was originally intended to um, provide nuclear flash trains for uh, power station uh, fuel but they've also diversified into other areas of business and a couple of other um, I think GB Rail, Rail Freight was just a, um, a totally new start business that's sort of sprung up all on its own as well as the franchise railways which are subject to government subsidy and essentially are, are operate under a contract to the government. Uh, there's also open access operators uh, like Grand Central and Hull Trains who just you know they're, they're completely private businesses they don't receive any subsidy and um, you know they run trains Basically, I, th I think it's through EU rules you've got to allow um, for 
open access so any company can come along and say hey we want to run the train here and yeah on you go so it's a very complicated um, structure as well of course um, there are passenger transport executives who sort of have a remit from local councils um, to specify commuter trains in metropolitan areas for instance Strathclyde Transport uh, you've got Greater Manchester PTE all the all these other little um, um, and then of course I'm, I'm not going to even get into the, the Transport for London um, which runs the London Underground as well so there's a, a few of these PTEs have um, like rapid transit systems like you've got the Glasgow subway uh, the metro in Newcastle and you've got the London Underground so I'm not going to talk about those I'm just going to stick with heavy rail so that's the situation we're in in 2021 a lot of the um, in 2020 because of this pandemic um, certain franchises which have been losing money have been brought back into um, national ownership as well also East Coast um, the East Coast franchise that's been in and out of government ownership it was GNER then they lost the franchise um, so it went to uh, I think it was, was it I can't remember who, who got it first. National Express took it over as National Express East Coast. Then it went to East Coast um, under the, the government operator of last resort when they lost the franchise. Uh, basically, the money ran out. Then it was given to Virgin. Virgin, again, ran out of money. And so it's back under government ownership under LNER, which is a... a they they brought back the old LNER name from, you know, back from Big Four days, which is interesting. Um, there's a few Southern, I think Southern Trains, Great Western, and LNER are the three names. I think without the three names that've been brought back, sort of resurrected from Big Four days. There's also uh, London and North Western Railways, um, which is an old pre-grouping. Uh, brand that's been sort of resurrected um, of course it's not the same company but they've used the name I guess for marketing purposes so that's how the, the organization of British Railways has kind of evolved over time now in the States they're still Essentially, it's a, it's still a privatised railway. Um, so you have um, all these different companies that own the track and the trains. Now, used to be, of course, freight and passenger, you know, railways. It all be owned with the same company, as was the case in the UK. However, uh, in 1971, Amtrak was formed, and this took over all the intercity. Uh, passenger trains from the um, private companies so it was a sort of quasi public corporation um, some of the local commuter trains again are run by regional transport authorities much like the passenger transport authorities in the UK so you've got Metro I think in Chicago uh, Coaster in San Diego um, there's, a, there's a few others that I can't remember off the top of my head um, so certainly in, in terms of passengers th there is that sort of tendency towards public ownership but in terms of the track uh, in the United States the, the, the physical infrastructure is still owned by those freight railroads, the, you know, the original private operators. Um, there has been a lot of sort of merging um, over the years, so a lot of the old small railroads have sort of merged together. So you've got Burlington Northern and Santa Fe sort of merged to become Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Um, there's a few others, um, but one thing you see a lot of in the US that you don't really have in the UK is what are called short lines. So these would be sort of little branch lines that are 
Um, you know, I think is it the Chesapeake and Ohio might be. I don't know. Um, little branch lines that are just self-contained railways, and they feed into the main network. Um, but they're all, you know, they don't tend to carry passengers, and it's usually a little, little branch line that's owned by itself, kind of like um, you know, sort of Colonel Stevens like railways used to be in uh, Britain, where you know. Um, you had a little branch line and it was tended to be run by little tank engines and it was all very quaint and not particularly fast um, but uh, it, it provided a service for, for the local area um, kind of done away with in the UK after um, after the grouping and then especially after the nationalisation when everything just became VR One thing you notice about the US, of course, it's much bigger than the UK, so let's talk about freight trains. Now, the US has a lot of wagon load traffic um, in what's known in the US as a manifest train, or um, I don't know what, what would be the equivalent of the UK. Basically, trains are just made up of different cars serving different customers in a marshalling yard somewhere. They put the train together. They send it off to the other side of the country, and it gets broken down and delivered by trip workers to the local customers. That sort of thing pretty much disappeared in the 90s um, on Brit British railways. It wasn't as efficient. I mean, back in the 60s, we used to have that kind of train, and then road transport took over, and it's there was a steady decline in those kind of wagon load um, movements. So most of the trains you see in the UK, the, the freight trains you, you see in the UK now are just block trains. So it'll be one commodity going from one source to one destination. Um, you don't see those big marshalling yards anymore. Um, you still, of course, you still have block trains in the US, but they've also got these kind of manifest trains as well, which are a lot more diverse and colourful. Um, I think so the the freight scene in the US is quite interesting actually um, passenger trains of course big difference um, in the US because of the distances and the <coughs> excuse me big difference between passenger services and Britain and the US because of the distances and the population density. So Britain, it's almost like Japan, you've got very high frequencies, um, very fast trains, very short distances, and it's just, you know, mass movements. Um, you know, I mean, London to Edinburgh is what, four, four and a half hours. So that is, the distances are way shorter in the US everything is so much more spread out you you got a lot more sleeper trains um, but a lot of places aren't connected um, by the railways railways railway travel in the US takes so much longer um, because just everything's more physically spread out um, there are commute trains of course um, I don't think there is many as in the UK but you know but certainly Costa for instance uh, for instance in San Diego um, a lot on, in the Northeast Corridor um, New York Boston Philadelphia Washington there's a lot of, I think the Northeast Corridor is the, the most sort of European um, part of the states in in terms of railways in terms of the traffic density um, particularly for passenger trains. You get out to the middle of the state and it's just empty space. So the consequence of the way the US is so much more spread out uh, and so much less densely populated than the UK is that trains are much less frequent and they take a lot longer to get from A to B. It's kind of like the Caledonian sleeper. You might get one train a day but it's going to take overnight or possibly longer to get to uh, where you're going. Another consequence of that is the US suffers quite badly with delays. 
two factors here of course the longer the trip the more delays can accumulate so you know you might you might be traveling for only a couple of hours in the uk you get stuck in a red signal for five minutes no problem you compound that over a day maybe even several days to get from one side of the america to um, america to the other um those delays add up and i've seen stories on i think on youtube of people being delayed by hours um another thing of course in the uk passenger trains always get priority over freight and that's the way it's always run uh you know express passengers come first then commuter trains then freight sort of shoved to the back of the queue in america because the freight railroads own and operate uh, all the track and freight is where they make the money freight gets priority so if you're on a passenger train you might be out of luck if you get stuck behind a freight train now one of the biggest differences the most obvious differences between the US and the UK is the size of the trains the physical size uh, in terms of loading gauge it's bigger you get double deck trains they have container trains that have two containers stacked on top of each other so the actual physical infrastructure allows for much larger trains a lot of the trains are a lot, a lot longer as well especially the, the freight trains um, I guess that's down to uh, passing loops and things like that they're just physically bigger something else about the infrastructure in the US I've noticed um, and this is just all of America not just the US but North America South America the whole continent some other parts of the world as well but you know we're talking about America here is the way that that the, the railways aren't fenced in as much as um, as they are in the UK uh, you know you, you can't just wander across a railway line uh, in the UK everything's fenced off it's all health and safety uh, there aren't so many level crossings except in flat areas like Norfolk um, you know Norfolk Lincolnshire you, you know you go along the East Coast Main Line or you go in that part of the country there's quite a lot of uh, level crossings but usually if a road crosses uh, a railway it's over a bridge um, in the US they seem to have a lot more uh, level crossings um, another thing you'll notice in this in the US which we don't really have in the UK um, is street running um, used to be one street running railway in England and that was the Weymouth Harbour uh, branch that is gone now um, they're actually ripping up the tracks right now uh, but they they still have that in the US where trains are just run down the middle of the street which uh, I can't imagine helps the um, line speeds much um, so yeah, you, you, you don't tend to see the railways fenced off as much in the US. Electrification is an interesting thing. So, I mean, Britain lags behind continental Europe and Japan when it comes to electrification. Um, but US, again, um, most trains are diesel trains. There is there are electrified uh, rails, again, in, in that northeast corridor around New York, Washington. But uh, most of the trains, certainly west of there, are diesel trains. In Britain, the big, the West Coast Main Line, East Coast Main Line, uh, and a lot of the commute routes around London, Glasgow, um, are all electrified. You go outside of those areas into the north of Scotland, into Wales, into Cornwall, um, and even a lot of the north of England, it's all diesel trains. Um, so we're definitely playing catch up um, when compared to Europe, um, Japan, places like that. Now, high speed rail. 
we've got basically one high speed railway in Britain at the moment, um, which is HS1, high speed one, channel tunnel rail link, whatever you want to call it, um, which goes from St Pancras to the channel tunnel. High speed two is a new railway that is proposed that's going to go from initially London to Birmingham, I think, and then potentially on to Manchester and Glasgow beyond that in the future. It's very controversial. A lot of people are against it for environmental reasons, cost reasons. Um, but they started building work on it, so we'll see how long it takes and if it gets finished. Um, in America, line speeds generally, you know, even just on the traditional, the, the, the older routes, tend to be lower than in the UK. Um, in the UK, the, you know, certainly the East Coast Main Line goes up to 125 miles an hour and that's just a regular railway. America has one uh, high-speed railway which is the Asila Express. Um, that's on the North East Corridor between uh, Washington DC, New York and Boston. Um, that's using uh, a sort of derivative of the um, French TGV trains. Um, so that's um, I think that's going to go to 150 miles an hour. Um, there's a few proposals for high speed somewhere, um, high speed rail or passenger rail in other parts of the country. Um, Brightline, uh, that's in Florida, that's mainly using um, at the moment an old freight railway, so they're going to be limited to 125 miles an hour. It's diesel powered. It basically looks like um, an Intercity 125, which is a normal, albeit fast, um, train in the UK. Um, uh, the Brightline one is shares track with the Florida East Coast Railway. I think they have a um, an owning share in, in Brightline. Um, so it's the only privately owned Intercity uh, passenger railway in the US. Um, so that would be an interesting one to watch. A proper grade separated high speed line is proposed for uh, the California high speed rail going from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Now getting on to the, uh, the exceptions I spoke about earlier. Northern Ireland Railways. It's part of the UK but at the same time the railways are completely separate. Um, Irish Railways, going back to Victorian times, Irish Railways um, were built to a broader gauge um, than Great Britain. So, um, for reasons that I can't fathom, um, Irish Railways were built to a gauge of five foot three, whereas Great Britain was all four foot eight and a half inches. So, there's no physical physical connection between. Ireland and Great Britain. Northern Irish Railways, of course, Ireland split in 1921, 100 years ago, and Northern Ireland remained part of the UK, whereas the Republic went their own way. Um, so, um, Northern Ireland Railways are owned by Translink, um, so it's state owned. Uh, it's vertically integrated, so the track and trains are still owned by the same organisation. So it's kind of like British Rail back in the day. Um, Translink also run uh, buses, I think, in in Northern Ireland as well. So it's it's a very it's a, it's a, it's a much more state owned operation. Uh, they jointly run the Enterprise uh, service between Dublin and Belfast with Iron Road Erin. Um, it was nationalised, uh, Northern Ireland Railways were nationalised in 1948 at the same time as British Railways and came under the Ulster Transport Authority. In the United States, uh, there is another rail railway in Alaska, the Alaskan Railroad. It looks and works like any other railway in America. It's owned by the state of Alaska, so again, um, that's interesting, state owned. It doesn't have a land-based connection to the rest of the states. 
despite you know Alaska being physically connected to Canada, there is no actual rail railway currently between Alaska and Canada. There are trains between Canada and the States, but nothing between Alaska and Canada. Um, so they use uh, a sea connection by barges um, to connect the Alaska Railroad to the outside world. Uh, there is a proposed route um, between Alaska and Alberta that I think has been approved by President Trump when he was still president. Um, so that might get in under construction soon. Um, so the Alaska Railroad well, runs between Seward and Fairbanks um, and it runs both path passenger and freight trains. So again, a lot of similarities there to um, sort of the, the way things used to be done with one organisation runs all the all the trains. Um, interestingly, Northern Ireland Railways, I don't think they've got many freight trains, if at all, there. It's all just passenger stuff. Um, uh, I think the the Republic of Ireland does have freight trains, but it's, they certainly don't have as many freight trains as Great Britain. Um, whether it's something they want to pursue, I don't know. That's entirely up to Irish Railways to pursue. So that's it. Um, trains, US versus UK. Which is better? Which do you prefer the trains in, in America, or do you prefer the trains in Great Britain, or do you think you know, uh, something in between? Comment in the comments. Uh, if you found this informative, give it a like. Um, if you want more content like this, give us a subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.